welcome the month of February, we welcome a new worship team. In our lives outside of church, we bring the events and the cares of January forward into February. And how was January so long this year? <laughs> In the same way, we bring the ideas and the feelings that we've built up around January's worship theme of wholeness with us into this month's consideration of connection. The topics of wholeness and connection are inextricably linked. I want to say that our relationships with each other are only as strong and as functional as we are as individual human beings. And I think there's a lot of merit in that line of reasoning. The old saying goes, when it comes to relationships, two halves don't make a whole. If we want our relationships to be whole, we ourselves must first be whole. This is true of relationships at every level, including the congregational level, which means that a congregation can only be as functional as its least functional member. And I do believe that. But I don't only believe that. It's true that healthy relationships are built on the foundation of a healthy self. But it's also true that we need each other in order to be whole. Unitarian Universalist theology is relational. On the Unitarian side of the house, there's this misperception that if you're smart and individualistic enough, you don't need anyone. And on the Universalist side of the house, there's the misperception that if you're woke enough and you do enough social justice work, you don't need anyone. You can't be any of those things without other people. This is the long-lasting tension between Unitarianism and Universalism that ever more clearly demonstrates that the two sides of the house need each other. <laughs> it is not our knowledge or our actions that make us whole. It is our connections that make us whole. Or rather, it is how we are connected. In this church, our connections are named and upheld by covenants. A covenant is a set of promises that we make to each other about how we will behave together. And we use these covenants to keep us engaged and respectful, even when things get tough. And they will get tough. Because we believe that spirituality is a lifelong group project, and we did not get to choose our own groups. It's easy to treat everyone with love and respect in theory. It's when we're faced with actual people that things tend to fall apart, especially if they start talking. <laughs> together is the foundation of our religious tradition, and that comes from our Puritan ancestors. We spent most of November dealing very frankly with the complicated and tragic aspects of our historical connection to Puritans. We won't dive back into that today, but I want to acknowledge it briefly before we look at their religious achievements. We hold these complexities in truth and grace, and we hope to be held that way by future generations as well. One of the Puritans' primary hopes was to find a new way of being a church. In 1637, a group of about 30 families living in Dedham, Massachusetts, wanted to start a church. They came from different religious perspectives, but they needed to form one church that fit their needs. And they didn't start with writing a creed or establishing doctrine. Creeds and doctrine were important to them. We don't have those now, but then they were very important. What was important to them, most important to them, was to talk about how the church would be governed. The Puritans left England and other countries to escape religious persecution. What felt most important to them was establishing a new church that granted the most decision-making power to its members while also meeting their religious and spiritual needs. These 30 families spent a year discussing questions like who should make church decisions 
and by what process? What should be the requirements for church membership? Who should call and ordain ministers? The result of their work was published in 1648 and cleverly titled, A Platform of Church Discipline Gathered Out of the Word of God and Agreed Upon by the Elders and Messengers of the Churches Assembled at the Synod at Cambridge, <coughs> England. Because there was nothing else to do back then but write long titles. <laughs> as compelling as it is, we just call it the Cambridge Platform. Okay. The Cambridge Platform is a covenantal agreement that outlined how churches would operate internally and how they would operate in relation to other churches. Each church would remain separate and not be holden to one another, but they were accountable to one another. They would share in mutual support and care, including sending ministers to each other when it was needed and sometimes admonishing one another. The Cambridge Platform established a system in which church members were drawn together by bonds of mutual consent rather than mutual belief. They were a church because they decided to be a church. They were not compelled by the government to be a member of the church, nor were they compelled to have exactly the same beliefs, nor were they compelled to accept outside authority on the practices of the church. And in this way, they were a free religious community. Created a system of governance, which we still use today, called congregational polity. The next major turning point in new theological history also happened uh, in the town of Dedham, which is now just really a strip mall, but um, back then <laughs> was a hotbed of religious activity. This was in 1818 the time of great religious upheaval. It was only a year before William Ellery Channing gave his famous Baltimore sermon marking the beginning of American Unitarianism. So just to clarify, the, the tension between the traditionalists and Unitarians was the question of the divinity of Jesus, Trinitarianism versus Unitarianism. So this and other questions had made, had made New England a power keg for religious tension. So, of course, they were using the Cambridge platform in new and exciting ways to creatively support and admonish the heck out of each other. <laughs> From the beginning of the Puritan involvement in this continent, the church was the center of town life. It is where people paid taxes. It is where they voted. It was the physical representation of the commonwealth of the community. This broader quasi-governmental role was called the parish, with a capital P. And there were people who lived in the parish, but who were not members of the church, with a capital C. The minister had a public voice in the parish and served as a moral teacher in that realm. And it is for that reason, under the Cambridge platform, that people who lived in the parish, but were not members of the church, had a vote in calling ministers. In 1818, Dedham needed a new minister. And the church found the candidate, the Reverend Alvin Lamson, to be too liberal, which is code for saying he was a Unitarian. <laughs> so they voted no. But the parish, the people who lived in Dedham but were not members of the church, voted yes. <laughs> so an epic conflict ensued. The conservative church members removed the church assets from the premises. So that included all of the town records like birth, death, marriage. They took it all away, including the communion silver, which had been bought, bought with taxes from the parish. They claimed that these belonged to the church. But the parish felt that these items, the commonwealth of the people, belonged to the parish of which the church was a part. They eventually went to court, and the parish won. Reverend Lamson's call to the church was upheld, and the conservative church members were required to return the assets to the parish. It should be noted that some found the court decision suspicious because the judge, Isaac Parker, was a Unitarian. <laughs> <laughs> but after a series of appeals, 
his ruling stone. This was a landmark case that allowed parishes and churches to separate. And over the next 20 years, about a quarter of the churches in Massachusetts became Unitarian. Sometimes the liberal Unitarians were the majority and they stayed in the building, and sometimes they were the minority, and so they left to establish a new church. I've always felt that the Denim decision is what allows us to really live out the Cambridge platform. It's like the nerdiest sentence I've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> the Cambridge platform is our right to choose how we do church. We choose to be a part of a church and to share our lives and our fortunes with the others who are also a part of the church. Mutual consent. But if we're stuck together because it's the only church in town or because we've been coerced, that's not really a choice, is it? It's not a choice if we don't get to choose. It's the presence of other options, but freely choosing each other, choosing this, choosing the people around you, that gives our covenants their value. We don't have to be here. We want to be here. The covenants upon which we build Unitarian Universalism start with the Mayflower Compact that says that the individual must be willing to accept limitations for the benefit of the group. Our next major covenant is the Cambridge Platform, which gives us a framework for how to make a church governed by the people that supports a level of religious diversity and exists in a network of other such churches. And the next major development was the Devon decision gives us guidance when the only way to be faithful to our promises of mutual love and respect is to go our separate ways. Some differences, the divinity of Jesus, are insurmountable. But that doesn't nullify our covenants, just modifies them. In fact, after the church is split, they were still governed by the Cambridge platform. They still are, to this day. That's why I was in Sarnia last week, fulfilling my Cambridge platform responsibility to serve another church when they ask. Unitarian Universalism is a covenantal religious tradition. I know you've heard me say that a lot, and I promise you I will say it again. I might as well get a teach. you might as well get a t-shirt. We are a covenantal religious tradition. And if you're still like, what does that mean? means that we have decided what is important is that we come here to be people together. It's our covenants that make us who we are, not our beliefs. Everything about us begins and ends with the promises that we've made about how to treat one another. Who we are is defined by how we are. Our bonds of mutual consent rather than mutual belief are as strong today as they ever were. When our ancestors set out to make their church, they started with a set of agreements about how they wanted to be a church rather than what they would believe. They put the power in the hands of the people, and that is where it has stayed, these 372 years. When we put on the mantle of Unitarian Universalism, we agree to take responsibility for ourselves and for those around us. We gather ourselves into the commonwealth of this congregation. By creating covenants that promote each other's well-being, we ensure that commonwealth against the vagaries of human life. Insurance does not keep bad things from happening. It provides a mechanism for restoring wholeness. Covenants don't prevent us from messing up. Up, they give us a way back into right relationship. It is our connections that make us whole, and it is our wholeness that fosters our connections.